Well, good morning, everyone. I'm Susan Ormiston, and uh, we're here to take your questions about some of the reports uh, on migrants at the Canadian-U.S. border. Last night on The National, I produced a story where we went down to Plattsburgh, New York, crossed over into the United States, and then followed the path, the well-worn path of migrants who are hoping to gain refugee or asylum status in Canada. We've seen this problem ever since uh, President Trump uh, came into the White House in November. And also it's a function of uh, a border agreement between the, uh, this country and the U.S., how this happens. We can talk about that a little bit more. But essentially what we saw from Plattsburgh, New York, are groups of people who've either come into the United States for the purpose of coming up to the northern border of the U.S. and coming into Canada, or they are in the United States temporarily and they're trying to get into Canada once they cross the border into Canada at an, at an illegal crossing, not an official border, then they are arrested and they begin the process of trying to apply for, for refugee or asylum status. It does raise all kinds of questions. I know it's a difficult subject for all of us as Canadians because this year we've seen, for example, at this border from near Plattsburgh, New York into Quebec, we've seen almost 12,000 people cross over illegally, meaning that they cross at an illegal crossing and then try to become uh, refugees in Canada. Uh, in total, I think we're looking at about um, 13,000 people have done this already in Canada this year. And the government has set up all kinds of resources to process these um, asylum uh, claimants to see if they can stay in Canada. And if they can't, they will be asked to leave the country. Um, Natalie Yvette uh, joining us. Good morning. Um, how can we organize this entry point to deter this immigration? It's not sustainable the way this is currently set up. It's a very interesting observation, Natalie. It's something I wondered as well. It doesn't seem sustainable in that this is a breach in our border, and yet people are still crossing. And let me just go back and explain why they are able to cross. Canada and the U.S. participate in what's called a safe third country agreement. And what that means is if you are from another country and you want to become a refugee in uh, Canada, for example, you cannot come to the U.S. legally and then try to apply to come into Canada. Safe third country must means you have to apply for refugee status in the country where you enter. So, for example, if you are from Nigeria, uh, if you land in the United States, under the law, you should be applying for refugee status in the United States. But there is an exception to that law, and the exception says if you cross at other than an official boarding cro border crossing, you have the right to ask for um, consideration as an asylum seeker. So in order to uh, plug that hole or to change that, it would require a change in that safe third country agreement. It would require a legislative change. And so far, the Canadian government has said that they're not prepared to do that. Um, Colette Sabaron asks, how many of these claimants actually get to stay in Canada? That's an excellent question, and we have asked that as well. We don't have current numbers. And what I was told by the um, border security services in, the, in Canada is that it's too early to give us statistics on how many are removed from Canada after this process. It's too early to say how many are deported, if any. But that is the question. It may be a question of time because normally um, it does say, take some time to go through the process. Once they step into Canada and they are um, assessed for security checks and don't have any criminal background or reason that we would need to deport them immediately, then they're, they go into the refugee claim system and it takes time for that to go through. So if you're talking about from January to September, um, it's unclear currently how many of those people have already been refused, but we're definitely asking those questions and hoping that those more current statistics become available. Uh, Mark. Mark, I think you were with us last night on The National. I recognize your name. Can the Trudeau government close legally that loophole if they wanted? 
I believe they can, but it is an agreement with other countries, so with the United States, for example. So it would have to be an agreement um, that was negotiated. The safe third country agreement means it's not just a Canadian law. So this would take negotiation for sure. Uh, some of the other questions that we, we've had around this issue is, <clears throat> Will this hurt Trudeau's chances in 2019? Tess Condon asked that. Well, that is a question of politics. It depends how much, how difficult a subject this becomes for the government. How they've chosen to handle it currently is put resources into speeding up the processing for these refugees and also to um, give them safe passage in that, you know, Last winter, people were crossing in the snow and getting frostbite, and now at Quebec, for example, which is the busiest illegal crossing now, um, they have set up winterized tents. They have a process where the uh, asylum seekers will go from there to another tented area in La Col, Quebec, and then um, as their uh, application is being reviewed, they, they will you know, be helped, there will be some sis assistance to find accommodation. The government is also looking at if they, these claimants do get permission to apply for status in our, our country, they're looking at whether they can speed up temporary work permits so that they have some income while they are going through this process. So that's how the government has chosen to handle it at the moment. Um, there is 24-7 RCMP patrol at that illegal crossing between near Plattsburgh and Quebec, and that's a cost, uh, an added cost to the government for sure. There will be added costs from extra people processing these claimants. So there is a budgetary impact of this unusual phenomenon that's occurred on our border, and it depends what Canadians think of that. We don't no, of course, everyone has an opinion. What we do know is that uh, one of the polls back in March of uh, this year said that what concerned Canadians the most was the prospect that some of these people would be crim have criminal interests or intentions that were getting across the border. We asked the border services here in Canada about that, and they say that less than 1% of the people crossing into Canada um, through this crossing have a, a significant criminality. They, that, that's how they framed it, so that less than 1% have been targeted as um, potential criminals. And of course, they would be dealt with in the way that we deal with criminal infractions. Um, we're talking on uh, Facebook Live about the migrant situation that's occurred on our borders, motivated by many things. Uh, some of the stories we did on this subject recently, you can see on YouTube uh, or Facebook. The links, I think, are on your, on your Facebook. Um, it was quite an extraordinary experience following the path of migrants. What I wanted to do was to go and test two things. One was test the government's assertion that things were under control. Uh, back in August, there were surges of Haitians coming in across that border, uh, um, many, many a day. Um, in August, 180 a day on average. And the government clearly saw this as a problem. It was overwhelming the system. And so they struck a task force. They sent ministers into the uh, situation. They added um, officers to help process the claims. They added resources. And they also sent um, parliamentarians down to um, communities, the Haitian community, for example, and some of the Hispanic communities, to stamp out some of the myths. One big myth, of course, is that this allows you to come into Canada and stay. That's a myth. But it's still circulating. People are desperate. They're desperate for a way out of America or a way out of their home country, and they're taking a risk. I had one woman tell me at that border, I know this is a risk. I know that this is a risk. I may not be able to stay here, but it's worth it because my situation is untenable in the United States. She had outrun her temporary visa in the U.S., so she was illegally staying on in the U.S. and needed a, a new country to go to. Um, so those were the things we wanted to test, and I also wanted to test this pipeline. So how does it happen? Uh, how do these people get here? How do they find out about it? Well, they find out about it through word of mouth. One woman told me she searched Google and saw that everybody was doing this. 
uh, in the communities. They pass information between them. I was surprised at how regular and how entrenched, really, this pipeline had become. Everybody knows about it. The taxi drivers, the people at the airports, uh, the bus drivers. It's a, it's a system, and it's pretty well oiled. So three or four times a day, a Greyhound bus comes from New York City, for example, drives six hours um, up to Plattsburgh, New York. Out comes passengers who know that they have to get a taxi. They know they're going to Roxham Road near Plattsburgh, 30 uh, minutes away, and they know what to do when they get to the border. They've, they've, been, they've been primed for what happens. One of the taxi drivers told us, in fact, that sometimes he's given a card with a phone number written on it. And the migrant says, please, when I cross the border into Canada, please phone my family and tell them that I've successfully made the crossing. So he does, and I said, what happens? He said, well, sometimes they break down crying because relief that um, their family member is in the system, uh, didn't you know, fall into danger on the route up. But the other thing he said, which was even more interesting, was often they say, well, Uncle Joe or Uncle so-and-so is going to be there next Friday. So you could see the perpetuation of this pipeline being um, communicated in these communities, and they're getting the tips on how to do it, they're raising money to do it, and they're coming up to the Canadian border to try it. So those were the things we wanted to test, and it was, it was quite fascinating to, to be there and, and see how it happens. Bob Price, thanks for asking. How long do we, the Canadian taxpayers, pay for these people to stay in Canada? Well, Bob, that depends. So when they cross into Canada, they begin an application to be considered as refugees or protected uh, status in Canada. Um, that process can take time. I don't have the exact figures because I haven't been given them, but on average, in a normal circumstance, you would be looking at about 60 to 90 days for the first hearing. It goes through a number of steps. What they need to know is what is the final resolution of the Canadian government? Do they get to stay as asylum seekers, as protected refugees in Canada? Uh, if they do, then they will go into our system as government-assisted refugees, and normally these people would get about a year of um, assistance to get them settled in Canada, and then they're on their own. If the answer is no, you are not eligible for refugee status, and that happens, then the understanding is that you must leave the country. The question is, and these are all questions we want to further pursue, the question is, do they leave? And if they don't leave voluntarily, does the government deport them? Has that happened, and how long does that take? So these are all important questions that I think Canadians fairly are asking, and um, we will be following up with the Minister of Immigration later this week to ask him some of those questions. Chris Jones, why are our border guards not protecting our borders by shooting anyone who illegally breaches it? Instead, they are helping them. Well, um, I, I, I don't think I'll answer the question about shooting them. I don't think that's uh, an answer that Canadians um, would endorse. But I think I need to make it clear, Chris, that um, they are illegal only that they are crossing illegally at a, at a crossing. It's a customs violation to cross anywhere except at an official border. So that part is illegal. But really, they are legally getting into Canada because of that exception in the law that says if you cross into Canada anywhere other than at an official border uh, with the purpose of claiming asylum, protection, then as Canada, as a law in Canada, we are obligated to offer you that, that, that option and to allow you to apply. I know it's complicated and it's hard to figure, but I think it's important. They are not illegals in that they are taking advantage of a loophole that has been created by our governments in the law. 
So the system allows for them to do it. So the RCMP can arrest them, but they can't turn them back. Am I making myself clear? That is what's going on there. It's a system, it's a, it's a, it's a legal breach. It's a legal loophole to which people are now, have found out about it and they are trying to use it. So that's what's going on there. Walid Rosidra asks, what's next? Well, that's a very good question. I think one of the questions I have is, what is next to the extent of, are we continuing to um, allow this breach in the law, this loophole in the law, allow this to continue on this way forever? I mean, that, that's a fair question. Uh, because it does put a, um, it puts an obligation on resources in Canada. Currently, it is a loophole it is a legal loophole in an agreement that this, can, this country has. And the government has chosen to um, put resources in to help process these people. <coughs> the question some people have is when do we close that loophole? Do we close it? How do we change it? And I think these are fair questions to ask now that we see that this is ongoing. I think the government made a big effort in, gen in, in August of this year to say we need to educate people from other countries that this is not a way into Canada. This is not a natural just come over the border and you're in. Because that perception perhaps is out there. But we see from migrants around the world, they're, some of them are desperate. Some of them just want to take the risk. They figure that even a slim chance of getting status in Canada is better than the reality they face currently. And so the question is, even though they know they may not be accepted, will they still keep coming? It appears they are. Not to the extent we saw at the height in August, but absolutely they're still coming. 5,500 crossed at that crossing in um, Plattsburgh in August, which was double the numbers in July. We expect from observation to see the numbers coming down in September, but how much? And interesting to note on the west coast of Canada, they also saw a spike in, in August. So 50 people came in at an illegal crossing in July into BC, 100 in August. Will we see that number go up or down? But it's still, they are still coming in a stream, whether it's this big or this big. And McDonald, given that it is an open crossing, why are there not plans to have a formal border crossing? Um, fair question, Anne. There is a formal official border crossing a few kilometers away from the spot where we were at. But the point is, if it's a formal official Canadian border crossing, then they are required to make their application there. They can't get into the country if they go to a formal crossing. They can only get in if they go to a informal crossing. That's the loophole we're talking about. So they have the choice of going to the border crossing a few kilometers away, but they will s be stopped there because of the third, the safe third country agreement. That's my understanding. And please, if I've misunderstood anybody out there who's in the immigration field, if I'm not getting it straight, it is complicated but that's how I understand the system works. Uh, what's the extent of vetting uh, our government's doing on these refugees from Wendy Lynette? Wendy, a great question. Uh, so the people who step into Canada at that crossing get the same kind of vetting as all refugee claimants would in the normal process. So I've spent quite a bit of time in the Middle East looking at refugee stories, particularly when the 25,000 Syrians were coming into Canada in uh, I guess almost two years ago now. Uh, so the same vetting occurs, biometric, biographical, criminal checks, uh, all the things that occur in a normal immigration process occur with these people. That's what the government commits to. So once they get across into Canada, they step across a meter of soil really, 
uh, those checks start. And if the, gover if the authorities find criminality, for example, they're set in a different stream and will be asked to leave, or they could certainly go, go into a different stream and probably would face deportation much faster. In the normal stream, then um, all those checks are done, medical checks, health checks, uh, identification checks, those types of things are being done. And it's, it's quite a rigorous process. We saw it happen in, in the Middle East when, when those refugees from Syria were coming to Canada. I, it's uh, rigorous and it's um, routine in that it's the same for everybody who's coming into the country. And as I said earlier, uh, what we do know, facts, data, is that less than 1% have been found to have some criminality, uh, serious criminality associated with them, and they would be pushed out or pushed into a different stream. Andrea Pierce, Percy, um, not criminals, asylum seekers, there is a difference. I'm not sure what you uh, refer to, but yes, these are not criminals. They are people seeking asylum. The fact, as I said before, the fact that they are crossing illegally is they are taking advantage of a legal loophole in Canadian uh, law, the safe third country agreement. It is the RCMP's obligation to arrest them on the other side. That's part of the process. That's what they want. They need to be arrested in order to start their refugee process through this pipeline. Uh, Manouk Abrahamin, help me there. How does this impact the situation Mon Projet Québec? I'm sorry, I am not familiar with uh, Mon Projet. Perhaps you could tell me a little bit more about it or write me and inform me or share some information about that. Shamarsky Simon asks, are asylum seekers the same as being a refugee? <laughs> That's a good question and you're gonna catch me out here. Um, asylum seekers are, my understanding, is that they are not the same as refugees. Refugees are people who are processed in the country of origin, so Syrian refugees who are fleeing their status, their situation in Syria would be processed in that country, apply, process, get all their checks, everything done there, and then admitted to Canada. Asylum seekers are people who arrive, I believe, arrive on our shores, and for the same or similar reasons, but choose to start the process there. I hate to be um, wishy-washy a bit on this, and I don't mean to be, but I'm sure you can appreciate this is complicated immigration law, and I don't have all the answers all the time, but what I love about doing Facebook Live is you ask me great questions, and then I go out and ask those answers, get those answers for you as best we can. Andy Kahn, why doesn't Canada do the same that the U.S. does at, at its southern border? Pick them up, process them, then send them back to the country they entered Canada from, the U.S. Um, I don't know why Canada doesn't do it. What I do know is that um, in this process where people are entering at illegal crossings, if they are deemed ineligible in Canada, Either they don't fit the asylum, seek, seek the asylum criteria, they are not protected status, they don't from a c come from a country that Canada has deemed needs protection, its citizens need, need protection, then they will be deported not to the U.S., but back to their home country. That's the way the law works. So if you have a chance to see the story that we produced at the border, you'll hear the RCMP officer saying, do you realize that even if you are in, can in, in the United States right now on a temporary visa and you are legal in the U.S., when you cross into Canada, that ends. That's, that's, it's, a, it's a clean slate. We will assess you as an asylum seeker from your original country. So if you are unsuccessful in Canada, you won't get to go back to the U.S. on your visa situation. You will be sent back to your country of origin. So that's the risk these people are taking, and it's quite significant because, for example, I met one wom woman, Lillian, you may have seen her in our story, very articulate woman who lived in New Jersey with her child. She had 
run out of her visa in, in the U US. It expired in July, so several months ago. But her baby, who was almost two, was born in the United States and so therefore was a citizen of the United States. She was risking that by taking that baby across to Canada in order, she said, for a better future for her son. Uh, so she was risking um, being sent back to her country of origin with her baby, a U.S. citizen, um, in order to get a chance in Canada. She believed that she, well, she couldn't stay legally in the United States anymore, so she was trying to get across into Canada. Um, How can they prove that they are actual refugees? What is the criteria? Tara Mills. So lots of things go into determining whether you are um, successful as a, a protected refugee in Canada. Um, it has to do with things like um, persecution in your own country, um, war in your own country, uh, whether you are um, a person that needs protection because of your gender identity or your ethnicity or things like that. The, uh, uh, Canada has a list of countries which they deem um, uh, are more easily defined as countries which uh, would have legitimate refugees, for example, Syria in a, a country at war. So there's a lot of factors that go in determining, and each case is different, but they, are, they do apply certain measures to the uh, application process as, as it goes through the review. Uh, Prince Angelo Saquin asks, what do you find is the biggest misconception that most people have about this issue? That's a really good question. I, I believe that the biggest mix misconception is that they have to believe they're going to be successful. Otherwise, they're taking too big a risk. So they're weighing risk versus opportunity. And I think possibly their misconception is that Canada is open to everyone. I heard one man stand at the border and shout to the RCMP, please let us in, Canada will help us. Uh, that is a problem for the government in that there's a perception that this country will allow any and all who need refuge to come in, and that is not the case. So the government has been working to try to educate, to change that perception, but clearly it's still out there. Um, Angelo Saquin follows up with, are people being influenced negatively by the rhetoric coming from our friendly neighbors to the south? Clearly. Clearly, people told me, standing at that border, President Trump doesn't want me, I'm an immigrant. They feel that their chances uh, are, have weakened of staying in the United States. One man, a Haitian man in this case, who flew up from Miami to uh, Plattsburgh to take a taxi to go to the border, he said, my application for status in America has been pending for three years. He said, I've given up now. I don't feel like my options are better now than they were three years ago when I came to America, came to the United States. So clearly the political climate in the U.S. is influencing people to be on the move. Uh, William A. Jennings says that Trudeau will never change this insane policy. I can't answer that, only the Prime Minister and his government can answer that. But as I explained earlier, the government has uh, recognized that this is a potential problem. In August, they uh, did a lot of things to uh, deal with the problem. Uh, they are, uh, if you look on the website referencing these issues, the government website, you'll see videos saying, you know, you cannot get into Canada just because you step one foot onto our soil. They're trying to deal with that perception. So that is the strategy that they've taken to try to um, curb the number of people coming uh, through these routes. Um, I think in the future they will be also um, 
probably giving us more information, I hope, about how many are successful coming through this route and how many are unsuccessful and therefore have to be removed from this country. And I believe that, you know, as these facts come out, um, that the government strategy is likely that these are communicated to communities back home, wherever that home is, that this is not a one-way sure route to Canada. Um, so we've been talking about um, migrants at the border with uh, Canada. Um, Jay Nandukan asks, can they apply for work permits? A good question. Uh, one of the things the government was talking about back in August was that once, the pro once they've been deemed eligible to apply for refugee status, the period of time they're in Canada, they need income. So one of the questions was, can we give them per, um, temporary work permits in order so that they can support themselves at that time? It was an active question in August, so I believe the government is, is looking um, for those types of things. Um, it's a really interesting discussion, and uh, it's ongoing. We're not going to see the end of it for sure. The uh, programs that we did uh, in the last few days have uh, opened up a lot of questions to be answered. Uh, you can see um, this is Brad Brandt. Uh, he is a U.S. Customs and Border Protection Officer and we went on a tour with him to other areas along the Quebec uh, U.S. border. So places in Vermont, for example, he showed me places where people do cross illegally. Often these are criminal crossings in the past, what his job has basically been to avoid um, cargo like drugs or smuggled goods from crossing that, con that country. Oh, we just had the lights go on. Um, and uh, he showed me the areas which um, have been a problem in the past with um, people crossing from both directions. For example, one area, they call it the tree farm, they've had smugglers um, it's very close to official boarding crossing, so they have smugglers on one side, um, drop people off, they cross on foot across the border, and the smugglers drive through the illegal crossing and pick them up on the other side. So he was showing us some of the ways that people try to breach the border illegally, not migrants, but other people. It's pretty interesting to go along this long, relatively undefended border, except for our border crossings, and see uh, the vulnerable points there. And of course, we can't hope to patrol all these areas for sure, but uh, it was an interesting insight. And if you want to watch that story, it's on YouTube as well, the tour with um, the US border, Customs Border Protection Officer. Um, I think that um, we've had a great chat and just looking up if there's any other questions. Uh, we're always happy, happy to answer questions. Uh, you can email me, uh, get, a, get in touch with me, um, at Ormiston Online is my Twitter handle. And of course, you can email me, susan.ormiston at cbc.ca. You can talk to our Facebook team, and we will try to get you the answers that you want. Thanks a lot for joining us on Facebook Live.